So as most of you know, mTOR is a protein kinase that's an evolutionarily conserved mechanism that regulates aging. So in every species study to date, whether you inhibit mTOR genetically or pharmacologically, lifespan and health span is extended. And so it's, since these are evolutionarily diverse species, it's likely that humans also are going to benefit from mTOR inhibition. So not only is the mTOR pathway very well validated, but one particular mTOR inhibitor, rapamycin, is the best validated therapeutic targeting aging biology in preclinical species. So again, in every species, yeast, worms, flies, and mice, this one drug has extended lifespan. And what's important is these findings have been validated by multiple different labs, which is very encouraging. So why does mTOR inhibition have these benefits for aging? Well, one of the interesting things is data in mice that showed on the study on the left was a very famous study published in Nature and funded as part of the intervention testing program by the National Institutes of Aging that looked at what happens to lifespan in mice who are started getting treated with rapamycin late in life at 600 days of age, which is the equivalent of about a 60-year-old human. And even late in life, rapamycin significantly extended lifespan. And then in the study on the right, this was done by Dudley Lamming's group, where he showed even if you start rapamycin late in life and treat just once every five days, that's sufficient to extend lifespan. So why? Well, one of the reasons may be because mTOR becomes dysregulated with age. So mTOR is the main protein in the body that responds to feeding. And when young mice are fed, as you can see here, the mTOR is activated. And when mTOR is activated, this stimulates protein and lipid synthesis that cells need to divide and organisms need to grow. And then during periods of fasting, mTOR is inhibited. And when mTOR is inhibited, this upregulates protective pathways like autophagy that gets rid of dysfunctional organelles and aggregated proteins. So mTOR should have this sort of circadian rhythm on when you eat, off when you fast. But at least in some aging organs in mice, mTOR remains apparently activated during periods of fasting. And so you never have these periods of the day where these protective pathways are upregulated. And this suggests that just turning down mTOR to a younger levels or just intermittently inhibiting mTOR may have benefits for human aging. And with all of this pathway validation, the question is, why haven't we done more to figure out what mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin do for human aging? And in fact, there are thousands of people right now who are taking rapamycin, but we have no idea what is the right dose, what's the right duration, where does the risk benefit actually favorable in which aging-related conditions. And to answer this, we have to do placebo-controlled trials. But there's been very few randomized placebo-controlled trials trials of rapalogs, which are rapamycin and its derivatives, for aging-related diseases. So why is this? Well, one of, it, one of the reasons are safety concerns. As Jim Kirkland mentioned, when you use rapalogs at the doses they're approved for cancer and transplant patients, these are high doses that completely turn off mTOR and have significant side effects. What really hasn't been well studied, I'm going to talk about some of the studies, but is the safety and efficacy of very low dose or intermittent doses of rapalogs that turn down mTOR to younger levels rather than turning it off? This is a really exciting area of medicine, and really we have only scratched the surface and so much needs to be done. The other issue has been patent concerns. So the current rapalogs have limited or no remaining patent life. And that, you know, hopefully with evolution won't be a problem anymore, but right now to get investors, it's really tough to get investors to invest in very expensive clinical trials for drugs without patent protection. So you could say, well, let's just generate new rapalogs. But this is incredibly difficult because the rapalog patent space is so crowded. So with these problems in mind, Novartis put a team together to develop next-generation rapalogs for aging-related indications. And they, not, they didn't just want another rapamycin. They wanted something better 
that also had patent protection. And they put some of the best Rapalog chemists in the world on this project, and they developed a portfolio of novel Rapalogs covered by three patent families that's now been out licensed to Tornado Therapeutics, which is a company that I co-founded with James Pyre at Cambrian. And we're excited because preliminary characterization of these compounds by Novartis indicates the lead compounds have distinctive characteristics that are predicted to enhance safety and efficacy as compared to the first generation of Rapalogs for specific aging-related diseases. We're just starting to move these into development, so I'm gonna talk, in the, spend the rest of the talk discussing trials we've already done in humans, looking at how we could use the first generation Rapalogs to treat aging-related conditions. So when we started this program a decade ago, we thought, how do we tell if Rapalogs have benefits for human aging? And we thought, let's look at the organ systems who whose function gets better when older animals are treated with Rapalogs. And the function of some but not all aging organ systems gets better. So neurologic function gets better, and again, it's in reassuring that this is reproduced by multiple groups. Cardiac function gets better, physical activity gets better, and aging-related immune dysfunction gets better. And we decided, as our first look at whether mTOR inhibition helps human aging, let's see if we can improve the function of the aging immune system, because it's an organ system whose function we can modify in a relatively short clinical trial time frame. So there's several potential benefits of developing therapies that improve the function of the aging immune system. Most obvious is that we should be able to improve vaccination response and decrease infection rates in older adults. But also, we now know the immune system is important for cancer immunosurveillance, so a drug that improves immune function may decrease cancer incidence. Third, you heard a lot about the problems with senescent cells from Jim Kirkland. The immune system is needed to clear senescent cells, so enhancing immune function might decrease senescent cell burden. And last, a really important paper was published last year in Nature by Laura Niederhofer's group, who showed if you just age the immune system in mice, other organ systems start to age. So the immune system may drive organismal aging, and inhibiting immune system aging may have more systemic benefits. So we started by saying, let's just see if we can improve vaccination response in older adults as a first readout of immune function. And we did two phase 2A trials that have already been published showing that if we treated older adults with six weeks of different mTOR inhibitors, we used two drugs that were already in the clinic, a Rapalog called Averolimus and a catalytic site mTOR inhibitor called RTB101, we could improve influenza vaccination response. So this was exciting because it was the first evidence that targeting aging biology in a human could actually improve the function of an aging organ system. We then said, why? Why is the immune system getting better? So we did non-hypothesis-driven RNA-seq in whole blood and looked at what are the gene expression pathways that change in older adults getting mTOR inhibitors. What was unexpected is the majority of gene expression pathways that were upregulated in older adults were interferon-induced antiviral pathways. So what is this path pathway? So the type 1 interferon response is the first line of defense we have against viral infections. So when cells such as, in particular, plasmacytoid dendritic cells are exposed to virus, they secrete type 1 interferons that bind to interferon receptors on other cells and induce the expression of hundreds of different antiviral genes that suppress the replication of all sorts of different viruses. This is our first line of defense against viral infections. It kicks in before the adaptive immune system. The problem is a key element of immune dysfunction in older adults is a deficiency in this type 1 interferon response to viruses. This has been shown by multiple groups, and we've reproduced it internally. But for instance, in this data on the left, investigators took males and females who are 20 to 35 years old or over 50 years old, isolated whole blood, and exposed it to herpes simplex virus. And you can see the younger adults made significantly more interferon in response to the virus than the older adults. And similarly, in the study on the right, these investigators took monocytes from young or old adults, 
infected them with influenza, and you can see the young monocytes make more interferon than the older monocytes. This deficiency in type 1 interferon response is probably one of the reasons COVID-19 is so severe in older adults because this plays a critical role in fighting COVID-19. So we said, all right, if we're finding that mTOR inhibitors unexpectedly upregulate this interferon-induced antiviral response, maybe we can use them to protect older adults from viral respiratory tract infections. And in most of these studies that I'm going to show you, we use the catalytic site inhibitor called RTB101. What's interesting is to induce this interferon response, you only need to use 1 120th the maximum tolerated dose in humans, so it's been very well tolerated because it's a tiny dose. So we've done a large phase 2B and phase 3 trial of this drug to decrease the incidence of viral respiratory tract infections in older adults. The phase 2B enrolled 652 older adults, and we met the FDA's requested primary endpoint of decreasing the percentage of subjects with lab-confirmed respiratory tract infections. But at our end of phase 2B meeting, the FDA said this was pre-COVID-19, this is new for us, developing a drug that improves immune function, and we think for the phase 3 trial, no one in the real world gets a nasopharyngeal swab when they get a respiratory tract infection. So we want you to just decrease respiratory tract infection symptoms and don't do any lab confirmation for your primary endpoint. And as all of us know now, in the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really tough to know when you are feeling sick, whether it's due to COVID or not without doing a nasopharyngeal swab. So this turned out to be a really difficult endpoint, and we missed the primary endpoint in this trial. It was really disappointing, but the good news is we've learned a lot that I think is going to help the field move forward. So first, we've learned that targeting aging biology with low doses or intermittent doses of mTOR, inhibitor is, mTOR inhibitors is actually well tolerated in older adults and really needs to get explored further in multiple indications. Second, we, in every trial we have looked, with every mTOR inhibitor, we are showing that low doses of mTOR inhibitors upregulate this interferon-induced antiviral response. Third, we think we've probably had the wrong endpoint in these previous trials. And I'll show you the data, but it looks like severity rather than incidence of lab-confirmed respiratory tract infections may be the appropriate endpoint for future trials. Fourth, I'll show you the data. We think that mTOR inhibitors are likely to have virus-specific effects. They work better for some viral infections than others. And fifth, it seems that the oldest of the older adult population, the people 75 and above, are the people who respond best and have the greatest treatment benefit. So first, just looking at the lessons learned about antiviral response, we looked at the expression of 20 different antiviral genes in whole blood during 16 weeks of mTOR inhibitor treatment or placebo treatment in both the phase 2B and phase 3 trials. And you can see most of these genes increase in expression in people who get RTB 101, but not in placebo. So what are these genes that increase? Well, this is the replicative cycle of a virus such as coronavirus, and these genes with the red stars are the interferon-induced antiviral genes that inhibit all sorts of different replicative steps in the life cycle of all sorts of different viruses. And these genes highlighted in green are the ones that are consistently upregulated in older adults getting low doses of mTOR inhibitors. So what's the benefit of upregulating those genes? Well, we looked at both the incidence and severity of respiratory tract infections as pre-specified endpoints in the phase three and the phase two, uh, 2B trial. If you look at the incidence of RTIs of any severity, mild, moderate, or severe, a 31% reduction was, was seen in people got RTB in the phase 2B, but only 11% in the phase three. The phase three actually was underpowered for this endpoint because the incidence of lab-confirmed RTIs was 50% lower in the phase three trial than in the phase 2B in the placebo group. But if you then start looking at RTIs with severe symptoms, you get a bit increased treatment effect in both the phase 2B and the three trial. 
If you look at hospitalizations for respiratory tract infections, the most severe infections, the numbers are too small to assess statistical significance, but a 74% reduction in the 2B and a 50% reduction in the phase three. So moving forward, we wanna look at severity rather than incidence of respiratory tract infections as the primary endpoint. Then the FDA asked us to look at the number of severe respiratory tract infections, <clears throat> excuse me, caused by specific viruses in each trial. So you can see, this is a busy slide, but it's the number of severe infections caused by specific viruses in the RTB treatment group in blue or the placebo treatment group in gray. And you can see in both the phase 2B and phase 3 trials, we had decreased numbers of severe coronavirus infections in people who got RTB 101, as well as decreased numbers of severe rhinovirus and influenza virus infections. But other infections like metanumavirus, we didn't see any treatment effect. What's interesting is the viruses highlighted in green have been reported to suppress the host interferon responses. So these are the viral infections where patients may get the most benefit of upregulating the interferon response with an mTOR inhibitor. And last lesson learned, and this may be more generalizable <clears throat> in the field, we've, we pre-specified looking at the oldest of the old in the phase 2B trial. So we looked at the a treatment effect of RTB 101 on the incidence of lab-confirmed respiratory tract infections in people greater than or equal to 85 years old or less than 85. And you can see there's a much bigger treatment effect, a 66% reduction in lab-confirmed RTIs in the oldest age group compared to the younger age group. In the phase three, we didn't have enough people over, 60, over 85 to analyze. We looked at people 75 and above. And again, the treatment effect was greater in this older age group, 43% reduction in lab-confirmed RTIs versus only 6% in people 65 and above, or I'm sorry, less than 75. So it may be that people 65 to 74, have a, many of them may have a relatively normal interferon response, and it isn't until you get to the older age groups where there's a more homogeneous deficit in this response and where you see treatment benefit. So taking all these lessons learned, we said after the failed phase three trial, let's test a different endpoint based on these lessons learned. Let's look at severity rather than incidence of a respiratory tract infection caused by a specific virus, coronavirus, in the elder, oldest of the old, the nursing home residents. So we did a clinical trial of RTB 101 prophylaxis to decrease the severity of COVID-19 and residents of nursing homes experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. The average age of the subjects was 82. It was just a small pilot trial. 18 people were treated with RTB 101, 17 with placebo for four, for four weeks during an outbreak, and then they were followed for another four weeks. The FDA prescribed primary endpoint to assess the incidence of severe COVID-19 was the percent of subjects who developed laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 with protocol-defined progressive symptoms, hospitalization, or death. Here's the results of the trial. In the placebo group, four out of 17 subjects developed severe COVID-19, two died, and no one in the RTB 101 treatment group developed COVID-19 of any severity. So this is a small trial that needs to be re reproduced in larger, well-powered trials, but it gives us encouraging um, evidence that we may be getting closer to the right endpoints for trials of mTOR inhibitors in the future. So in conclusion, I think this program provides evidence that targeting aging biology to improve Im immune function of aging organ systems is likely to translate to, from animals to humans, and that's encouraging. And this program, the RTB 101 phase 2B and 3 trials, suggest that future clinical trials are going to benefit from a more targeted primary endpoint and patient population. And I think as a field, we have to understand there's going to be a learning curve for investigators, sponsors, and regulatory authorities when moving into these new endpoints. But we're going to learn from each of these trials and get better and better. <clears throat>